Welcome back, Dad, for podcast 49. 49. Now, I just want to start with a story and imagine, and this is hard to imagine with you, <laughs> but imagine walking into a dog adoption center. You want to get a pet. And in one corner, you see this sleek, perfectly groomed dog, uh, but it barely notices you. It doesn't look at you. It doesn't really care about you. It seems uninterested and cold. Mm -hmm. So you try to give it a treat. But it just is like, I don't care that you're here. So it looks like a nice dog, but it's not too nice. Mm -hmm. Then in the other corner, you see this scruffy, pitiful little puppy. Mm -hmm. And you try to give it a treat, and then it starts wagging its tail. Uh, it starts licking your hand, and it's very thankful. Um, the point is, uh, one of these dogs might look perfect, but it's kind of the messy but grateful one that steals your heart. That's true. So in today's episode, we're going to look at something that's very similar. Mm. Simon the Pharisee. He is polished. Yes. He seems very proper, mm -hmm. but he's cold towards right. Jesus. Mm -hmm. While we're going to see a humble woman who has a very messy past, mm -hmm. known as a sinner, yeah. but she pours out her love and gratitude. And just like that grateful puppy, she knows the Lord and needs grace. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, just to kind of draw the similarities there. So why don't we, I hope you guys all stick around mm -hmm. as we're going to be talking about how Jesus is moved by humble, loving hearts and not those that seem perfect, but keep them at an arm's length. Yeah. So uh, this is podcast 49 in the Jesus Said That series, looking at every word Jesus spoke in the New Testament. Today's episode is entitled Jesus, the Woman, and Simon the Pharisee, which is taken from Luke 7, 36 through 50. Yeah. Good to be back with you. I was uh, thinking of how to introduce this. I've hit it from different angles with family and such and such, but I was thinking another point of commonality is our hobbies. Uh, we're both weightlifters. Uh, I, I laugh <laughs> because I can remember 40 years ago. Uh, going to buy my 405 pound Olympic weight setup. And I've been faithful to, to stick with the task. And Josh came 1986, 13 years later. I uh, had him going, you know, a couple years later than that. I uh, had Dan going and then you going. But you and I have uh, something in common too, because we have been youth pastors, you currently and me in the past. And uh, if someone were to ask me one key word that should be the definition for every youth pastor, I would say it's the word intimidation. <laughs> I can still recall someone was uh, asked about me back in the day. And this was a quote of the young man who attended our swim and study. We had a Bible study at a, a pool. And he says, I don't know if we believe everything Kenny said, but who's going to argue with him? <laughs> <laughs> So having said that, unfortunately, you tweaked your back yes. the other day, something all yes. of us have experienced. How you doing? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. I'm getting over a cold and that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm not feeling too good. Okay. But uh, it's better than yesterday. I'm able to move. Good. Yeah. I, I, I noticed some I can, mobility there. I can there. turn. Yes, so and that's, that's a big improvement. I creak, you. But yeah. Uh, yeah. So I was doing, I started back up the P90X because I've, I get up at uh, about 5.30 each morning, or most mornings, and then I try to work out with uh, Stephen, mm -hmm. who was one of the young men who's now a deacon at the church. And uh, I decided that it was just too much. I was doing lifting and then trying to do my bike. Right. But by the time you do both of those things, it's like the day. I know. It's all, almost like 8 o'clock, and it's like I need to be in the office by that time. Yeah. So I decided I'd do P90X. It's about an hour, and it's just... Weights and much more cardio, but you on both angles. I, can, yeah. I, I even went, I went light and I, I told Becca when you do it, cause I've done it right. a couple of times. I did different ones. And I can remember seeing you and Stephen crawl up the steps yeah, it's, out of our it's basement. Yeah. It's, it's your working muscles. You don't even know you have. Exactly. It's like, I didn't even know I had a muscle there. In it. Yeah. So, but yep, I'm doing a lot better. Good. So, Glad uh, to hear I'm, that. I'm alive. So that's, that's right. get through the pain. I'll be fine. <laughs> All right, so let's just hop right into this. Mm -hmm. So passage. this passage, uh, the passage preceding this one, Matthew 11 and Luke 7, mm -hmm. is really important unlocking this passages. 
Yeah. Um, in these passages, Jesus condemns the self-righteous people in the city that reject him. Right. If you were around for the other podcast, do you remember that? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. However, he expresses gratitude for those who come to him as infants, basically. Mm-hmm. And he says, come to me, all of you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Mm-hmm. And after he says that, this is when the woman chronologically comes to him. Mm-hmm. So it's possible that this woman heard this and then came to Jesus, yeah. or like many people, maybe she heard many of his messages, mm. but she understands who he is at yes. least. And we're going to see that this woman, this man is a lot like those cities who is self-righteous and doesn't think he Falling. needs Jesus. So it's perfect parallel. And then in our next study or coming up, especially in Luke 8, uh, there's a discussion of a group of women who provide for Jesus. Yeah. So I, I kind of think this builds the bridge between those passages. So I think we can go ahead and just get sure. right to it. So um, this is Luke 7, if you're in your Bible, uh, starting in verse 36 mm-hmm. through 50. It says, Then one of the Pharisees invited him to eat with him. He entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. So we know this guy's man's name is Simon the Pharisee. Yeah. We'll find out a very common name, mm-hmm. but we don't know much about Simon right. um, other than his name. However, Jesus is going to point out near the end of the passage that Simon did not show him basic respect. Yes. That he did not treat Jesus as an honored guest. Mm-hmm. So that will be bared out as we go. So this kind of implies that Simon's motives may have been kind of questionable. Yeah. Because why would you have a rabbi over for a meal and then not show him basic courtesies? So, And this was the exacting lot. I mean, if anyone knew protocol, it happened to be the Pharisees. I mean, they talked about how to wash your hands and, and all of this. So what he doesn't do uh, is not by just mere overlooking it. I think there's much more. I don't think it's a spur out. of the moment. Hey, let's come over and get McDonald's. Exactly. <laughs> this is a meal. Exactly. So. All right. Now, they're reclined. Mm -hmm. We have to understand at Jewish meals, they would recline on the floor. Mm -hmm. They would have something like a carpet, pillow, something like that. And they would rest kind of and make an L shape. So they sit like this and then their legs would be behind them. Mm -hmm. So just kind of, you know, people sometimes said like your feet would be in your face, but technically they're behind you so that no one, you know, you don't have to deal that while you eat. Yeah. So we come to verse 37 and it says, And a woman in town who was a sinner found out that Jesus was reclining at the table in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume. So this woman is not viewed as a good woman from her former life. Right. Yeah. (laughs) If you are known in the Bible and you're only known as sinner, it's it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Uh, I kind of always wondered that uh, Luke not ever find out who this woman was mm-hmm. or did he just kind of spare her you know who she was later on in the church i don't know yeah but they they don't say who this woman is just she wasn't she was a sinner and often the term sinner is used for a prostitute yeah so it could just be the polite way of saying hey she she was a former prostitute yeah even when you look at the groupings in the new testament uh, you'll have the God fearers, you know, those Gentiles who didn't want to jump all the way into Judaism. Uh, but clearly, she's of that group who just disregards the law. So she would be despised above all, yeah, from their eyes. So possibly yeah. she heard this from our last podcast with chronologically just what have happened to Matthew yes. 11, 28 through 29. Mm-hmm. Come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, Jesus said, and I will give you rest. Yeah. And then he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me because I'm lonely and humble in heart mm. and you'll find rest for your soul for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Yeah. Now, the question is, how did this woman get into the party? Yeah. So I did some research on this and Leon Morris, um, he wrote down, and I have what he wrote, a meal such as the one that Jesus was attending was not private. People could come in and watch what went on. At some time, a prostitute would not have been very welcomed in Simon's house. So it took courage for her to come. Mm. So we have to remember it's kind of a showy culture. (laughs) I kind of thought like of the red carpet events in Hollywood, right? You have those who are invited inside and the spectators on the outside. 
but it's very showy. So, I mean, here are the the big guns, if you will, of the religious community. So anybody would want to come and see what's going on. So you would come and it's kind of almost like a political thing. You come, yeah. they let you kind of come into this area. You can mm. observe, you can hear the conversation. Yeah. And then, you know, you go and tell everybody, hey, I was just at it's, Simon's house and exactly. Simon had an important guest. Yeah. So here they are there. And she was carrying an alabaster jar. Mm-hmm. So this is uh, made of sulfate of lime, carbonate of lime, white or yellow stone, and it came from Egypt. Yeah. And it was cylinder shaped at the top. So um, just some information. It was nice. It was used for important things. It wasn't yeah. your little plastic container that we would have today. It yeah. was something very precious, even the jar. Exactly. So it says in verse 38, and she stood behind him at his feet. Yeah. So we have to remember, he's sitting at the L. She approaches, weeping, and began to wash her, his feet with her hair, or tears, I should say. Mm-hmm. She wiped his feet with her hair, kissing them and anointing them with the perfume. So this woman, along with others, comes into Simon's house to mm-hmm. hear Jesus talks. And then she kind of bravely steps out from the onlookers and breaks down behind Jesus. Yeah. She just totally has a breakdown. And as she's having this breakdown, uh, she starts crying and it falls on his feet. So was she crying out of joy? Was she crying out of, Mm. you know, anguish? We don't know, but she was, she's there to worship Jesus. And there's a lot of activity uh, that's going on. Um, Three times you have the imperfect tense, the continuous action in past time. So with the word wiped, kissed, and anointed. So apparently she keeps on doing these things. So this is not just a little, you know, no, no. it's just bang. She's totally applying yeah. herself. And the humility is shown because she's weeping openly. People often would go and find a place to hide. So she's a very humble uh, woman and it comes out in the text. I mean, even the fact that she is washing uh, his feet with her tears and wiping them with her hair because hair was never let down. It's, it's another sign of humility. So uh, she definitely is quite the contrast to the self-righteous Pharisee because everything testifies to humbleness. So it's it's possible that she was going to anoint his head. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. This is just possibility. We yeah, don't know. Right, I agree. Yeah. So she could have went to anoint his head, which would be a custom. Yes. But then she started to cry. It fell on his feet. So she's embarrassed. So then she goes and tries to dry her tears and just does her act there. Yeah. So that's very possible. Or maybe she was going to anoint his feet. We don't know. Yeah. But whatever her plan was, she starts to worship Jesus. And I think this, there's some good points for us. Mm. She approaches Jesus with faith. Yeah. She believes who he is. Yeah. She displays humility. She's not arrogant. That's right. All right. She engages in worship Mm -hmm. and she presents Jesus with her costly gifts. Yeah. And I think that's a, a good example for us to follow, much different from uh, Simon the Pharisee yeah. that we're going to see in a moment. So she's the righteous one. He's the self-righteous one. You've heard me say, uh, ministry that costs nothing is worth nothing. Uh, she's pouring out her, her heart, but also her saving. She makes me think of Mary uh, taking yes. that costly perfume Uh, 300 denarii worth 300 days um, and just pouring it out on Jesus to anoint his body for burial. And and here you have a similar act. And you got, God bless these women because women just weren't regarded highly in the culture, but a lot of humility and showing clearly they understand who the Messiah is. And this is, to clarify, different from that account that happens near the end. Yeah, I've seen commentators try to pair them. It's uh, totally different Yeah, good point. Good point. So who knows? Maybe Mary was somewhat copying this woman. We don't know. <laughs> but both were incredible. Yeah. So when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, if this this man, if he were a prophet, implying he's not, yeah, would know who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, she's a sinner. Yeah. Now I have a quote here from Warren Wearsby said, Simon's real problem was blindness. Mm -hmm. He could not see himself, the woman Mm -hmm. or the Lord Jesus. It was easy for him to say, she is a sinner, 
but impossible for him to say, I am also a sinner. Yeah. Jesus proved that he was indeed a prophet by reading Simon's thoughts and revealing his need. Yeah. So I think our question today, one of them is, are you like Simon who looks down on people with a self-righteous attitude? Yeah. Saying, I would never do that because I'm better than that. Yeah. <laughs> That's, and you can even tell from his thinking that he didn't respect Jesus. So Jesus replies to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. He said, say it, teacher. And I think that's cool. Jesus reads his mind. <laughs> yeah. He knows what's going on. Once again, he's God. So, yeah. And if I could just capture, yeah, yeah. this is Please. great. This is great writing. I mean, if he were a prophet, the second class condition, assuming it not to be true, Simon then think he's a prophet, but somehow Luke brings into play Jesus reading the mind, showing he is more than a prophet. And I I, I don't know, you, you just have an appreciation for good writing. I guess it helps to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. But just that contrast is just, is tight. Luke is very educated. Yeah. Much different from Mark. Yeah. Not hate no Mark, but yeah. it's just the style. Right. So he says, I want to say something to you. So Jesus reads his mind and he decides to illustrate, which I love using illustrations, why to express yeah. how this woman, what, why she was worshiping him, giving the Jewish rabbi a logical uh, choice to make in this parable. Yeah. So here comes the parable. A creditor had two debtors. One owned 500 denarii and the other 50. Yeah. Okay. So the denarius was an official Roman coin. And it was valued at about a day's labor. That's mm -hmm. how we round it about. Mm -hmm. So a typical day of work was from six to six. <laughs> Tired thinking about it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Especially if you're in the field. Ooh. Yeah. So one man owed a debt surpassing one year's worth of salary, mm. while the other man owed still a nice bit, but two months worth yeah. of salary. So something you could make up, but the other man was way more. Since they both could not pay it back, he generously forgave them. Yeah. So which of them will love him more? So Jesus's parable is simple and it forces Simon to acknowledge the correct answer. Exactly. And I love that, that he forgave them both. Yeah. Um, we see Jesus offers forgiveness even to Simon. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not like, I, I'm going to die for that woman, but not you, Simon. Exactly. You know, he, he, his love is for all men. Mm. So he asked him the question. And I use this method with, uh, especially when I work with young adults, just put it into a parable or a saying that gives an obvious answer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Instead of saying, this is what you should do, sometimes say, here's two options, which one is right? right. And then people make their own choice in their mind because they know. So he said, uh, Simon answered, I suppose, I like, I suppose. I love The that. one he forgave more because he knows he's being set up. And Jesus says, you have judged correctly. Yeah. So this woman, obviously, in the parable, is like the one who was owed a lot and was forgiven. If I can give you a little plain word, Simon did not want to play Simon Says. I mean, in verse 43, I suppose, he, you can tell he doesn't want to <laughs> play arrogance. the game. And a little history, because I know this is really important, everybody. When I do research, because I looked up, I was just curious when I preached this back uh, some years ago, Simon says, actually, the original statement was Cicero says, who was a Roman orator and uh, statesman and politician. <laughs> so apparently, hey, Carrie Klotz, whatever he said, you did. And then later we uh, took from that and said Simon, but Simon doesn't want to go there. And it tells you his haughtiness as well. I can almost hear him going, I suppose the one he forgave more. It's just like, can we get away from this topic? Because the Lord's bringing him down because he needs to be humbled in order to be saved himself. Yeah. And it's really the contrast, which we're going to see between the humble and the arrogant. That's right. Yeah. I was just texting you uh, about my James Bible study. Mm -hmm. we're going yeah, I love hearing. Book. Yeah. And just how so many of the commentators miss <laughs> so much of what James is about. Yeah. When you're really just teaching verse by verse, but a chapter at a time, you get the big picture. That's right. And the big picture, it's all about judgments, the mm -hmm. Christian's judgment, because yeah. it's all the brothers and sisters. And I'm amazed how people rip those verses out of context. And when it talks about the rich man, like 85% of the commentators will say, well, because they murder and do all this stuff, they can't it, be saved. They can't be Christians. <laughs> and, and I believe he's using overstatements. Yeah. 
And I, I did some sourcing where in Jewish culture, they said, if you take away a man's livelihood, mm -hmm. it was the same as killing them in their mm -hmm. mind. Yeah. And the rich man wasn't paying his workers. And I, I believe it's referring to Christians. Yeah. But basically, as you're working through the book, it's giving two examples basically throughout the book. There are those who are humble mm -hmm. and they're not having wars and fights among them. And then there's the self, the arrogant, the proud, yeah. but they're Christians. Yeah. And that's where all the fights and wars come among them and they're abusing the poor. And I really kind of see that in this passage. It's the parallel between, it's not because Simon's maybe rich, but he's yeah. arrogant. Yeah. And the, the woman, we don't even know she's poor. All we know is she's humble. Right. And that's all God desires. If we're uh, if we're humble, we won't be starting wars, fights, and war arguments. Yeah. Or if we're arrogant, that's where it all comes from. So. And just as you have a very early written book, James, we've talked First. about this. <laughs> then you have Corinthians pretty early itself, and Paul brings up pretty much the same thing. He says, "You have envy, strife, and divisions. Are you not carnal and behaving like whom? Like mere men?" So we can all practice these things, and uh, you make an excellent point. Yeah, no, thank you, just, James. I appreciate the comments. Good to yeah. see. Yeah. God wants us to be humble. Exactly. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the whole point. So Jesus is going to show Simon that uh, this uh, sinner has shown her Lord more respect than Simon did, mm -hmm. which is quite powerful. So uh, let's just look at these verses. Uh, Forty-four. Mm -hmm. Turning to the woman. He said to Simon, I like that. So he kind of looks at her, but he's talking to Simon. Yeah. Do you see this woman? I entered your house and you gave me no water for my feet, but she with her tears has washed my feet and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but she hasn't stopped kissing my feet since I came in. You didn't anoint my head with olive oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. So Jesus really calls out Simon and is showing how... This woman showed way more respect and respected Jewish customs way more than Simon It's did. so countercultural. I mean, we used to go through the food aisle and there was People magazine, all the pretty girls, all the pretty people and all the notoriety. And nobody wants to look at a woman weeping at the feet of Jesus, washing uh, his feet with her hair. And yet Jesus says, look. Take a look at this. I mean, it just tells us the people we need to be looking to for our examples. So I just want to show you historically what was expected mm -hmm. when you had a famous rabbi to your house, which yeah. Jesus was. Yeah. Then we'll look at Simon's lack of respect. And then third, the woman's actions. So hospitality, we'll just start with that. Mm -hmm. And when someone would come to your house, they walked on dirty roads. Yeah. There was no cars, no Teslas, no Fords, nothing. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> it was your horse, you, maybe no horse, no donkey, you just walked. Mm -hmm. So it would get dirty you, yeah. and you'd want to wash, you know, it's just basic sense. So when your guest would come, you would have them wash their feet. Mm -hmm. And if it was a person of honor, you would actually get your servant to wash their feet for mm -hmm. them. So... He didn't do that. So mm -hmm. he didn't give basic hospitality. A greeting with a kiss. It was a sign of friendship. Yes. You know, it, just this little side type of thing. Yeah. They come in the door, you greet them basically saying friend. Yeah. And this was a custom in Israel. Mm -hmm. And not to kiss someone was a sign of disrespect. Okay. And then we have the anointing with oil. Mm. Now, this wasn't as common. But it was an honorable gesture that was given to important people. Yeah. So if someone really important came, to, like if uh, Nicodemus came to your house or exactly someone from the point. Supreme Court, yeah. you would give them this oil to say you are an honored guest. Mm -hmm. uh, he did not do yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So Simon really showed a lack of respect totally. for the Lord. Mm -hmm. Now, Jesus is going to call him out for that. Yeah. So he says, Simon, you were rude, basically, exactly. not showing me respect. And just to kind of uh, give an illustration, just imagine I had like a pottery party. Not, not that I plan on having a pottery party, but just but imagine, I weekend, but yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> imagine I'm having a pottery party and I invite everyone over and we all attempt to make pottery out of clay. So we're all messy. And after completing this, I say, let's sit down and let's eat some dinner. Mm -hmm. But then I don't offer them any towels, any water. Mm -hmm. I don't say you can go to the bathroom. 
yeah. and everyone's sitting there with filthy hands, um, you would say that's a horrible host. Exactly. And that's exactly what he did here. Mm-hmm. Jesus comes in pride dirty from the streets mm-hmm. and he just doesn't give him the common courtesy. So Jesus calls him out for that. Mm. He didn't kiss him. And then the oil, he's self-righteous and didn't show respect mm. to the one who would save his soul. Yeah. So we look at the woman and now I, I honestly think she did it right. So she washed Jesus's feet with mm-hmm. her tears. Maybe it wasn't intentional, but she still did it. Mm-hmm. And she humbled herself, uh, which was something that Simon thought was below him. Yeah. He was arrogant. Right. So here she was. She greeted Jesus with a kiss. So hers was obviously more than a greeting. This was worship. She understood. It seems like at this time that he's the one who's going to save her. Mm-hmm. So she just showed him worship. And then finally, after giving him the kiss, she anointed him with oil, yeah. which was a sign of that you are someone super important. Yeah. And after all, Jesus did save her soul. That's right. So <laughs> there's a lot going on here. Mm. And then mm-hmm. Jesus says, therefore, I tell you, her sins have been forgiven. Her yeah. many sins have been forgiven. So yeah. she, was, she was a crummy person before that. That's why she loved much, but the one who is forgiven little loves little. So Jesus doesn't sugarcoat and said, oh, she's not that bad. (laughs) He said, oh, she had a lot of sins, but they're all forgiven. So like the parable, those who are forgiven much should love much. Mm. The problem is many people view themselves as Simon and are self-righteous, and they do not see themselves as this woman saw herself. And they are cold, just like that dog in the illustration. And they're like, yeah, I don't need your help. So boy, then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Mm. Only God can forgive sins. Exactly. So this causes quite some trouble. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Then those who were sitting at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this man who even forgives sins? Yeah. Yeah. Unlike, you know, the paralytic where Jesus does a miracle, he doesn't do a miracle here. So the people are like, who does he think he is? You know, but uh, he's the son of God. And this implies that Simon's friends were probably opposed to Jesus and his ministry too. Mm-hmm. So We would do well to spend more time thinking about how much we've been forgiven. I think of someone in later that Luke will write about Barnabas and he recognizes all that's been done for him. There's a need in the church. He sells his property to care for the people. But then here come Ananias and Sapphira by way of contrast, next chapter, and they put on a show that they had done more than they actually had done. People that understand that we were, were spiritually dead, we we're going to hell, and unless there is a divine intervention, we're, we're forever lost. There's just an appreciation for those that have hit the bottom uh, and as this a sinner woman, and she's just showing her appreciation, but we're saved the same way and should have the same appreciation. If there's no sacrifice too big to make for the one who gave it all for us. And I like how Jesus's sacrifice is kind of set in stone. Yeah. Because he said, your faith has saved you, go in peace. Yeah. It's, it's as good beautiful. as done, even though he hadn't died on the cross yet, he yeah. knew he would. Yeah. And that's the same way the Old Testament saints were saved. They put faith and it was accounted to them as righteousness. Yeah. And then they would be saved after Jesus died on the cross in a mm-hmm. technical sense. Exactly. So, and we would both say, which I think is biblical, that the intervention is the gospel message. Yeah. Because we see some say, well, the Holy Spirit has to come and regenerate you and do all this first. Yeah. Uh, which totally takes away the power of the gospel. The it power does. of the gospel is that when a sinner hears it, then they can accept it and exactly. be saved. So. But we won't get into all that. But this woman, and I like past tense, your faith has saved you. Yeah. You know, um, I honestly think that her salvation happened even before this event. Yeah. A lot of people think she was saved as she was worshiping him, but I think she, she put her faith in Jesus. And because of that, she came, she fell down, she worshiped him. And this was just the outcome of her faith. I think you nail it. Even the word here, saved, is perfect tense. It's, it's not a, saves you. Exactly. Yeah. It's, a, it's an act in the past with the results continuing. Uh, and I think she manifests in such a wonderful display of 
appreciation that she she had been saved. Yeah. So, yeah. and why could she go in peace? It's because she saved. Yeah, doesn't have to exactly. fear death. She doesn't have to uh, be guilty over all of her sin. Exactly. So. We moved through that quick. I was trying to. It was a lot of great job. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anything you want to add before we get to our employment points? No, I'll wait, and I'll, I have a text just to kind of share when you walk through those that I think also connects with it. Which because I, I love your employment points. So we have three employment points. One, by faith, humbly seek Jesus to worship Him. Yeah. Um, it appears this woman had a previous knowledge of Jesus. Uh, and had already put her faith in him or his message. And because of her faith, she sought him out to worship him. Yeah. So we need to humbly seek Jesus to worship him once we're saved. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and question to ask herself, do I humbly seek Jesus? Do I seek his will in my devotions and through prayer? Also, how do I approach him? Yeah. Um, am I a, righteous, a self-righteous Simon mm. or am I poor in spirit? Yeah. We should be poor in spirit. Exactly. So a thought we should have in this story, do I find myself aligning more with the self-righteous Simon or the humble woman? Mm-hmm. I think a lot of us identify much more with Simon mm-hmm. <laughs> in all honesty. Yes. Then point two, discover genuine righteousness by embracing humility and willingly sacrifice for Jesus. Mm. Now full, but the woman humbly poured out her perfume on Jesus's feet. Mm-hmm. This act of worship was costly and she gave something that could not be given back to her. Yeah. So question to ask yourself, how have I sacrificed to worship Jesus? Mm. How do I sacrifice? Uh, the key word is sacrifice or to give up something for the sake of a better cause, mm-hmm. my time and money for the Lord. Yeah. And then a thought, have I embraced a humble heart before the Lord? Do I willingly give or am I greedy and like Simon not show Jesus the worship he deserves? Mm. And then our third and final point, uh, uh, seekers find salvation and rest as Jesus responds to their humble faith. So this woman found peace because Jesus had forgiven her sins. Mm. Question, do I know peace and rest since I placed my faith in Jesus? Too many Christians are warriors. They yeah. are. And they need to say, everything's fine. Do I understand that once I place my faith in Jesus, he responds by saving my soul? Mm. And then thoughts, how often do I take time to thank God for sending Jesus to save my sinful soul? And Jesus does not pile up multitudes of rules and regulations for his disciples. No, his burden is easy. Simply obey his words and cling to his identity. So what would you like to share? Yeah, in uh, Philippians chapter 3, Paul, a former Pharisee. So I thought this kind of connects well. For we are of the circumcision who worship God in the spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he may have more confidence than him, uh, Paul goes, that's not so. Uh, Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him. And this is the connection, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith, in Christ. Literally, this could be faithfulness in Christ if it's a subjective genitive, because he's so faithful, uh, we now have the salvation for another day. The righteousness which is from God by faith. And I thought, Paul got it. You know, he was so self-righteous, but he was a good Pharisee, a good Jew. But when he met Christ, he understood his own sinfulness, humbled himself, got saved, and said it's all about Christ. Yeah. We can just see from that. So yeah. we can learn a lot to be humble. <laughs> yeah. Not look to the law and think we're great. Exactly. All right. That was podcast 49 in the Jesus Said That series, looking at every word Jesus spoke in the New Testament. And today's episode was entitled Jesus the Woman and Simon the Pharisee. And obviously, after Jesus is a comma. So <laughs> Jesus <laughs> isn't a woman. That's so right. In this date, we have to say that. So exactly. Jesus, comma, the woman, comma, and Simon the Pharisee. 
which was taken from Luke 7, 36 through 50. Yeah. So anything you want to share with uh, what's going on in your life? Yeah, yesterday was a, was a special day. Um, I'll take everybody back a few weeks. My former publisher came and said, and I never saw this one coming, uh, I'm retiring and the publishing house is going to be closed down. So your nine books will be out of print. So the awesome. best way I can describe <laughs> that is if somebody took a big eraser and took nine years of your life, because it's about a year per book. Uh, so I reached out to my uh, current uh, publisher, Morgan James, uh, Terry Whalen, special brother in Christ. He said, let's talk with the uh, owner, David Hancock. We got on and uh, yeah, I was touched. God really encouraged me. Uh, David Hancock said, we love your heart. And Terry Whalen said, everyone should have your books. So uh, we will be taking these books and I get to edit all nine, which I'm that excited about because you know what it's like after you've taught something, you come back years later, you Wish always I have that more different. to add. Exactly. <laughs> uh, so I'm currently doing Devotions on Fire and that will be released first. And every three to four months, these books will be um, out again. Which is but, crazy and fast. Which is crazy fast. But the good news is because of working with Morgan James, who has offices globally, and they're just around everywhere. There will be a lot more publication or excuse me, a promotion, but I will have access to 2000 books with each new release uh, for $5 a book. So in other words, the foundation, the Ken J. Bird Senior Foundation, we're looking at in the next four years, putting out about 20,000 books uh, around the globe to those who need them uh, because you include the uh, Ephesians book that was just uh, released. So, oh, I'll tell you, the Lord's good. I felt so limited. And then I turned to the Lord and I said, okay, Father, we've been through these kinds of things before. Your limitation usually means you want to expand the ministry. And he's He's doing that. So thank you to everybody who's been praying for us and our outreach. Uh, but this is great news because it just takes all my books and just makes them much more accessible for all. Uh, it was great news when you shared it with us. So, yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> Looking forward to it and new covers and additional content. Oh, yeah. And the edited content. So, keep your first edition. It might be worth something. But, <laughs> uh, buy the new one when they come out. Exactly. Too, it'll Please. Be even better. Yeah. Things have been good with me. Um, got to see Dan a little bit, my brother. Yes. And he came in for a little bit to DC. So, that was wonderful. Absolutely. And, uh, a lot of good stuff happening. Uh, yeah. A lot of wonderful stuff. One big announcement. I can't just share it yet. You know about it. Yeah. You know, it's a tease. Hopefully next podcast I'll be able to share. Mm -hmm. um, just a big announcement. So that's, I'll share that next podcast. And uh, my Christmas album just finished at for the kids. Very excited about that. It's well done. You've heard it. Also, it's awesome. Yeah. It releases in November yeah. on my website and it's all free. So you can download it. And uh, 15 original Christmas songs, uh, each song, well, 12 of them are based off of just the Christmas story, each yeah. passage, because I'm working through every single lesson, um, every single narrative. Yeah. So it has a verse and then the theme and then kind of tells the story. It's great. So kids, hopefully I have almost two seasons done. Yeah. So uh, very happy about that. And uh, then two special other songs, bonus songs I put on there. Uh, so a lot of good stuff happening, and uh, I'm just really looking forward. And I'm shocked how fast we got through this study. Me too. Me too. <laughs> I originally had like 15 pages. You told so. me you had preached, and I go, oh, uh, no, because hey, I, we joke because of just the detail. We we understand that. And it was like, there's a lot you had research put down. I took out my old notes, and I go, we could be out here a while. You you jokingly said, well, we have four hours left on a recording tape. And I go, well, the text isn't that long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did the fire method. We did it with the the young adult ministry. Wonderful. So we went through it. And I, when I was done, I had like 30 pages of notes yeah. on this. And I was like, oh, yeah, I, I got it down to eight. So yeah. I thought that was good enough because we don't want to be here all day. That's so right. I think with all that said, uh, we'll call it a day and we'll see you next time.